The place stank. A queer mingled stench that only the ice-buried cabins of an Antarctic camp know. Compounded of reeking human sweat and the heavy fish oil stench of melted seal blubber. An overtone of liniment combated the musty smell of sweat and snow-drenched furs. The acrid odor of burnt cooking fat and the animal, not unpleasant smell of dogs, diluted by time, hung in the air. Lingering odors of machine oil contrasted sharply with the taint of harness dressing and leather. Yet somehow, through all that reek of human beings and their associates, dogs, machines, and cooking, came another taint. It was a queer, neck-ruffling thing, a faintest suggestion of an odor alien among the smells of industry and life. And it was a life smell. But it came from the thing that lay bound with cord and tarpaulin on the table, dripping slowly, methodically, onto the heavy planks, dank and gaunt under the unshielded glare of the electric light. Blair, the little bald-pated biologist of the expedition, twitched nervously at the wrappings, exposing clear, dark ice beneath, and then pulling the tarpaulin back onto place restlessly. His little bird-like motions of suppressed eagerness danced his shadow across the fringe of dingy gray underwear hanging from the low ceiling, the equatorial fringe of stiff, graying hair around his naked skull, a comical halo about the shadow's head. Commander Gary brushed aside the lax legs of the suit of underwear and stepped toward the table. Slowly, his eyes traced around the rings of men sardined into the administration building. His tall, stiff body straightened finally, and he nodded. Thirty-seven. All here. His voice was low, yet carried the clear authority of the commander by nature as well as by title. You know the outline of the story back of that find of the secondary pole expedition. I have been conferring with second-in-command McCready and Norris, as well as Blair and Dr. Copper. There is a difference of opinion, and because it involves the entire group, it is only just that the entire expedition personnel act on it. I am going to ask McCready to give you the details of the story, because each of you has been too busy with his own work to follow closely the endeavors of the others. McCready? Moving from the smoke-blued background, McCready was a figure from some forgotten myth, a looming bronze statue that held life and walked. Six feet four inches he stood as he halted beside the table, and with a characteristic glance upward to assure himself of room under the lower ceiling beam, straightened. His rough, clashingly orange windproof jacket he still had on, yet on his huge frame it did not seem misplaced. Even here, Four feet beneath the driftwind that droned across the Antarctic waste above the ceiling, the cold of the frozen continent leaked in and gave meaning to the harshness of the man. And he was bronze. His great red bronze beard, the heavy hair that matched it, the gnarled, corded hands gripping, relaxing, gripping, relaxing on the table planks were bronze. Even the deep sunken eyes beneath heavy brows were bronzed. Age-resisting endurance of the metal spoke in the cragged, heavy outlines of his face and the mellow tones of the heavy voice. Norris and Blair agree on one thing. That animal we found was not terrestrial in origin. Norris fears there may be danger in that. Blair says there is none. But I'll go back to how and why we found it. To all that was known before we came here, it appeared that this point was exactly over the south magnetic pole of Earth. The compass does point straight down here, as you all know. The more delicate instruments of the physicists, instruments especially designed for this expedition and its study of the magnetic pole, detected a secondary effect, a secondary, less powerful magnetic influence about 80 miles southwest of here. The secondary magnetic expedition went out to investigate it. There is no need for details. We found it, 